the thing I'm going to be talking about today is how to build a team that launches a thousand plus performance creatives every month for each brand. Well, we don't do it for every single brand. We have a very, a very number of creatives that we launch per brand, but um, for some of the bigger brands we work with, we're doing over a thousand per, per brand. Um, and it isn't just using AI. It's kind of doing, there are, is a lot of manual work involved. So this is not some kind of software kind of thing. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to unpack exactly how we've done it. And I go through like all the kind of like stuff I've learned over the last kind of few years of doing this. And if I didn't show you an ad account, it didn't mean it didn't happen. So here's a hook to kind of get you in. Uh, here's one of our clients who spent uh, 4.1 million in 30 days. Um, this brand actually was profitable on first acquisition, got into the meta disruptor category. Um, and we're pretty proud to say we scaled this, you know, over the course of two, three years working with them. Um, pretty crazy result overall. So I'm just going to unpack like some of the strategies that we've used to get to this point uh, where we can get some growth, um, you know, get kind of results that we have done for this kind of brand. Um, and I'll, I'll just start with some like charts. I love charts. Um, I used to be an accountant, so charts are like my, my, my thing. Um, I just want to kind of hammer home the point of like, basically the more ads you make, the more revenue you're going to make overall. And this is like an interesting kind of like zoomed out perspective on things. Um, so for this particular brand, you'll see, uh, this is over the course of two and a half years. You'll see the number of ads launched in light pink and you'll see the amount of spend in purple. Um, you can see these two lines kind of roughly track each other. So as new ads are launched, as the volume of ads launched increases, you know, you see it kind of follows uh, in line with spend uh, and of course revenue. Uh, and this point on the right here is just kind of a similar thing to what's on the left, but is done by um, each point is like a month. So basically number of ads launched in a particular month on the X axis and on the Y axis, you've got amount of spend. So you can see like literally the more ads you launch, <laughs> the more we're spending. Um, and there's a pretty, pretty strong correlation over here. Um, so for this brand, we were launching 750 ads per month at 4.1 million in scale, which is kind of peaking out around around here. Um, so, yeah, this is a common question I always get asked a lot by kind of clients who are coming on board or like just generally in people like how many ads should you make? It's like a it's such a difficult question to answer. And nobody nobody ever has like a precise answer to this. There's no we've tried to calculate it. There's no real formula, um, but you have to come up with some kind of like guesstimate right? some kind of way of thinking about this. Um, what I will say is like you just need to launch a lot a lot of ads to get to get scale. Um, uh, for one account, we had 429 ads per month, and that peaked at 2.2 million in spend. So again, just another example of like how my, how many ads you need to launch in order to kind of achieve that kind of level of scale. And if I was to break that down, so number of raw assets, I did a little we made a little script in Frame.io which actually showed you how many assets we had for that um, how many assets we had for that particular client. We had 35,000 raw images and videos, which was insane when I saw the number. I, co I couldn't believe it. And uh, when we broke that down, that kind of ended up launching. Obviously, we didn't use every single asset, but from that, we we use those to launch around about 5,000 ads in a year. Um, and that kind of broke down in terms of it actually was quite an even split between new concept and iterations. Um, so yeah, you can see like just sheer volume is important. I'm just trying to get the point across here that like it's a volume game. Um, so everything I'm talking about today is like how to achieve volume, how to build the team structure, how to kind of like how we've done it. Um, so hopefully you guys can take something from it. Um, yeah, I've already been introduced, but this is just there for like housekeeping, I guess. So I'm the CEO, one of the founders of Venture Beyond, growth marketing agency, team of 40 of us in the UK. Um, we have clients worldwide. Most of our spend is actually in the US. Um, and our main thing is growing econ brands. We work in partnership with some brands as well as an affiliate, sometimes on an exclusive basis. Um, just a bit about what you do. You guys can check this out afterwards, look at our website, all that kind of stuff. But in general, we're full, we're full service. We work with a handful of clients. We don't work with loads. Um, but we do everything from growth, creative, CRO, retention marketing, uh, the full stack, basically. Um, some of the brands we've worked with, um, Evan mentioned a couple, Jeep, Delcy, Benetton, Peugeot. There's some of the like more blue chip type brands. And then we've got some of the other kind of, um, you know, founder driven e-com brands kind of underneath here. Some of the team, I have to give them a shout out. I thought it was worth kind of putting them on the screen because, you know, I couldn't have done this without the team. Super proud of what the guys have achieved. And uh, I can't take all credit for this. Like, this is the work that's been kind of contributed by everybody over the last few years to, to get us to this get, get us to this point. So a big shout out to the team. Anybody who's watching, any of the team are watching live now, just want to say big massive appreciation to you guys. And anybody of you, any of you who are watching afterwards, just again, another shout out to you guys because I, uh, I know you'll be gassed by that. Um, and here's, I'm going to unpack this one in a bit more detail. People always love this kind of a diagram. So I, I will go into it in a bit more detail in a second, but this just gives an overview of like how our team is structured, just to give you a flavor of like how, how, um, we achieve, you know, the things that we do. Um, so like the key kind of principle underlying all of this in my head is like revenue growth is basically the number of ads you make 
times by the quality of the ads, right? So like, how do you measure each one of these? So ad quality is pretty simple. It's like, okay, how, how many winning ads have you got? So one internal metric that we came up with was like ads that spent more than $1,000 divided by the total number of ads. Um, and to kind of caveat that as well, we do look at like, are they spending within seven days? You know, are they getting to $1,000 spend within seven days? If they're not, we might not consider them to be a, to be a winner. Um, and typically, you know, we're around about 5% success ratio. It does go up and down month by month. Um, but effectively, you know, this is one part of the formula to increase your revenue. You've got to look at the, you know, the quality of your tests and what your success rate is. The next thing is around ad quantity. So I guess this presentation, I'm mainly going to be talking about how to achieve this quantity. Um, quality stuff, I can do this on another another time. I'm sure some of the other speakers have spoken about how to you know improve success rate. The main one I'm going to focus on today is around ad quantity, um, which is a formula. You think about it, as you break it down further. It's basically how many ads can each team member make times by the number of team members you have times by the amount of time that you have, right? And that kind of gives you an overall uh, quantity and number of ads you can produce. Um, like where did this first start? I guess like three, four years ago, I started to unpick the process of like how to really produce creative at scale. Um, and overall, this is the main problem statement, right? It's like, okay, it takes too long to get ads briefed, edited, approved and launched. Um, it's a serious, like when you look at all the project management involved and all the different steps and stakeholders and people, it's actually a pain in, pain in the backside. Um, and yeah, like I just wrote this because it was like top of my head. I could, you always get that feeling like, oh, I could just do this in mid journey in Canva. Like, why, why is everyone so slow at everything? Like, why isn't it working? Um, so like, I really tried to attack this problem in the last few years to figure out, you know, the perfect way to sort to solve this. So hopefully I'm going to share some of this with you. Option one, if you're an entrepreneur, this is where everybody starts, you know, you do everything yourself, not sustainable. You're going to burn out. There's a cap to what you'll earn, um, cap to what, you know, you can physically do yourself. And then kind of like, this is obvious business stuff, but I, I thought I'd lay it out here. Like, what is the actual way of actually scaling up? You've got to engineer a good process. You've got to find the best talent you can find, mentor them, incentivize them as well, give them some upside, give them something, some portion of your profit. Um, and then you really want to kind of like test strategies bottom up, like, you know, get small teams to test things. And then once you get something winning, kind of inject into the whole team top down. Um, listen to the market, listen to the data, motion, got to plug you guys, you know, you're great for that, for, for providing us like data visibility day to day, all of our team use it every day. It's a you know, super useful, super useful tool. Um, and then just keep fine tuning, you know, keep fine tuning on what is working and our techniques and things are always changing, you know, it's, it's, it's a moving beast. Um, and if I'm to break this down into like five key areas, which I'll cover today, um, I can't see the comments by the way. So like, I have no idea what's going on in the comments. I think, uh, if there's anything interesting, Jem, you'll have to shout at me. Um, but I'll try. I'll try and grab the comments afterwards because I've um, I've got it on full screen. So yeah, first I'm going to go through like what is the team setup, uh, then how we plan our work, then how a specific ad or ad set is produced, and then how do we make it all go faster? So like what are our KPIs or you know service level agreements that we have internally? And at the end, I'll just give you our tech stacks. You know, you can go and replicate a lot of this stuff yourself. Um, like I'm not going to hide anything. You guys can have all this stuff. I've given a lot of documents in the um, doc section. So like I will um, touch on some of the documents uh, as I go through this, um, but you're more than welcome to just use those. Ask me questions afterwards about it. You know, if you need anything, just, just shout me. Um, so breaking down the team setup. So if I was to kind of think about this in, in principle, like how do you actually scale accounts predictably? Um, it's a comp what we do is a combination between, we do the creative production and the media buying, right? So we have a lot of automation that runs our media buying. So whilst we have some things uh, done manually, budgets and bids adjusted manually, there's also some automation happening, which kind of keeps things ticking like throughout the night, certain times of day, um, you know, it gives us, gives us the opportunity to actually scale when a human being is not looking at the screen effectively. You couple that with the data that is actually fueling that process. Um, and then on top of that, you've got a growth team and a creative team who basically just makes the whole thing tick. Um, so the way I think about it is like, our growth team, really, you've got growth strategists and creative strategists, which I'll explain in a, in a bit more detail in a sec. But our growth strategists are usually STEM grads. So they're people who've done like a science degree, engineering, maths, usually super data people. Um, and then like creative team tends to be people who are more like copywriters, editors, designers, content creators, and then they want to become strategists, you know. So we do kind of upskill people internally to become that or we hire people directly into those roles. Um, and then I say like key other things. I mean, this is like obvious stuff, but I got to say it, it's like you got to have the right product and offer and price. If that stuff is wrong, you're never going to sell anything. We've taken on clients in the past thinking, okay, we can do this, but the product and the offer has just been wrong. So that's like a base fundamental in my opinion. Um, and then just, yeah, I think I've touched on the other couple of points here. 
Um, and something I just wanted, I just playing with mid journey, made some images. Another kind of like key problem I think that always comes up in in teams is when you've got um, I've got my business partner here looking at my face. Um, we've got media buyers. He's our head of growth actually. I'm going to put him on the screen. He's running. He's running away. Um, so media buyers, dear sir, I'll fight you with my data. You are wrong. Creative strategists, dear sir, I'll fight you with my ideas. I am right. It just came to my head something to write down and that's like the sentiment of like there's always this kind of clash between left brain and right brain um people talking almost in a different language uh, motion really helps for that as well because it kind of makes uh data really super visible and accessible to creative teams um but yeah just kind of trying to overcome this by having like a good team structure and good communication is, is absolutely essential in my opinion um yeah, where did we start? Like we started with small scale teams. So we used to have like a pod team which had effectively everything planned and executed in one place. Um, so the work was planned and edits were made, the approvals were done all in one in one spot. And it was like super simple and like very efficient. You can run a pod with three people and you can do a crack a million in spend. Um, it's com completely po it's completely possible if you get the if you get the right kind of formula. Um, the problem is, as we were scaling up, we realized that like this is not scalable. You actually need to you need to specialize. Um, so basically, like how I think about this is like as you scale, you require lots more diverse skill sets and specialisms, and then each specialism needs to kind of like branch off into its own team, uh, which is how we ended up with like different teams, like data team, CRO team, post production, content creator team, um, a physical studio team, and this pod soon became it soon became quite difficult to run because. Each of these lines going out here was essentially a request form. We had request forms going out for each of these, and then we we're waiting for things to come back from each one of these teams. And in the middle, basically, there was no strategy happening. It was just pure project management and communication. People were just trying to tr chase to the rules, not knowing where things were up to. And we have several pod teams, right? And so the pods were actually sucking on resource from all these kind of sub teams, um, which meant that like the pod team never had predictability on like you know when they were going to receive things back. So. This was kind of like where we were maybe two years ago, a year and a half ago. Um, and I had to relook at this and think, okay, this is not working. How do we fix it? What do we do to improve this? Um, and yeah, kind of like key issues that were coming up were, you know, dependency on the pod team actually initiating all the work. So like they became the bottleneck very quickly. And, and a lot of the times there was an underutilization of these sub teams. Um, people were not using their skill. They weren't using their time, their capacity. Um, and yeah, biggest problem overall was like communication. And I, I love this diagram. It's from Google, but I think I'll just share it because it really hammers on the point for me. It's like when you've got two people in a team, there's one line of communication and it's very easy. It's like, okay, did you do it? No. Okay. I'll do it. And communication project management, super, super easy. When you get three lines, it even starts to get more complicated because you've got three lines of communication, four becomes six. And then there's actually a formula, right? So there's N times by N minus one. So we've got a team of roughly 40 people and that actually calculates to be 15, 1,560 lines of communication. So imagine you've got Slack DMs with 1,500 sets of Slack DMs going on. You just can't have that, it doesn't work. Um, so try to avoid this as much as possible and minimize the kind of lines of communication. So kind of thinking about how to actually improve this, I remember seeing this diagram and thinking, okay, you've got clusters and you have key people in those clusters who communicate with other people and nobody else communicates. Um, and how this kind of pans out is, and I'll, I'll show you in a second, is we have a core growth team and they kind of like are the small cog that has the strategy and then you have delivery teams which deliver on the actual uh, executables, things that need to be done, deliverables. Um, and the whole idea is you've got um, multi multi-skill small delivery team, which is way more efficient, or you have a single skill large delivery team which can do more volume. So for example, when you've got a post-production team with 10, 20 people or what in there or whatever, um, it's much more efficient to have them in one team because you build best practice, you have management, you can give people pay rises, you can you can kind of like really customize like the way that people do work. You can manage it in a, in a singular way and it creates a lot of efficiency. So kind of to achieve the hybrid between like, these small teams and big teams working together, we ended up a bit more like this. Um, so we've still got that pod team. Uh, the different one of the differences is you've got the creative strategists who can kind of almost do a bit of everything. So some of our CSs are producing stuff in mid journey. They're doing a few edits. Um, they are shooting content if they need to shoot content, um, and that kind of makes them full stack. So they can do a lot of the let's say concepting and things like that inside the pod itself. So strategy and execution is still happening inside the pod at a smaller scale. And then you've got these external delivery teams. Um, but the difference is now is like. They shouldn't be you shouldn't they should not be rely, reliant on the pod team to actually say hey I need this stuff. Instead, they're giving insights, quotas, constraints, and overall priorities. And these guys should be able to produce on their own, 
and give deliverables back to these guys without these guys initiating the work. Um, I hope that makes sense. There's a bit of a mouthful there. Um, there's one caveat here that like usually these teams are not so great at copy compliance when it comes to certain kinds of brands. Uh, you know, copy compliance becomes an issue because they're in a regulated industry or you know they're selling supplements. There's only some claims you can make and can't make. So it has to pass through. We have a compliance uh, manager internally. So we usually kind of pass them through and that usually gets them to the point where they are launchable. And then kind of like just, yeah, breaking that down, I guess, back to the diagram we had before. Um, the way I see it is like this growth team is that kind of small cog, which sets the strategy, sets the direction, does some small amount of execution. And then you have this kind of like larger creative production team with the sub teams over here. So you have, um, you know, content coming in from our studio. We shoot that in person. We bring models in if we need to. We do a lot of point of view UGC stuff as well. Um, we work with content creators, you know, hundreds of content creators just to produce content on a regular basis. They bring raw assets in to the creative production, uh, to the post-production team. Um, these guys actually do their, some of their own open briefs, which on, that means they're not always waiting for briefs from the growth team. But more often than not, the briefs are coming from the growth team itself. They're sending assets in to the growth team. These guys are launching them into the ad account. They're running tests. We extract the data into a warehouse. Um, and then we've got a data, small data team who basically um, provides all the kind of, let's say, data in a cleaned up way, uh, accessible to the growth team. Uh, they've got some you know, dashboards and, and charts and things that they build, uh, which I'll show you some of in, in a second. Um, and yeah, I, I said I'm going to be doing tons of giveaways, so I'm just going to do this. Um, I thought I'd give away our job scorecards for like two of our key roles that are inside the growth team. So the growth strategist and the creative strategist. Um, this breaks down exactly like what their targets are, what their key responsibilities are, um, who they report to, which team members they interface with, uh, and what kind of people we're looking for uh, when we take on these people. So these are in the doc section, check it out. Um, I've given both docs. Um, I wrote this one myself, my business partner wrote this one uh, for creative and for growth. So. Um, you know, I'm always like open book, just take it, do what you want with it. Um, if it's rubbish, don't use it. If it's amazing, send me a message and tell me it's amazing. <laughs> share share something about it. That would be super cool. Um, so second aspect, again, like I've only got a short amount of time today, so I, I could talk for ages about team setup, but I'm just giving you a kind of a, a flavor of like um, you know, what I've been thinking for the last, the last few years. Next step is like, how do you plan work? So we plan work in sprints. A lot of people are using sprints right now. Um, at the, at the moment, we're doing two-week sprints. Um, so, like, how do you plan a sprint? The first thing you need to think about is, like, how many ads do you need to produce? <laughs> and is Peter of Elon Musk saying as much as possible? Um, and the answer is, well, that would be nice, but it's just physically and practically not possible, right? So you've got to think about, I think about this as, like, an equilibrium of, like, high volume or low cost or high quality, and you can only choose two of these elements. You can't have all three of them. So either you're going to be high volume and high quality, but it's going to be super expensive, or you're going to be high volume and low cost, but it's going to be low quality, uh, or it's going to be low cost and high quality, but you're not going to get the volume right. Um, so like, where should this equilibrium point be? Should it be in the middle? Uh, I don't think so. Like my, my, my point is it should be kind of a bit to the up and left. So you want to kind of deliver high volume, low cost, lower quality. Um, this is on average. So for some brands, we have to produce like some high quality stuff, some low quality stuff, and there's a, there's a mix. But on average, I'd say you want to be definitely kind of up and left of center there. Um, so how do I think about like how much creative we should produce? So I'd start like backwards instead of looking forwards. It's like, think about how much team resource you currently have. Like, what are you currently paying for? What are your overheads? Who do you have access to practically? Like who tomorrow can you go to and brief stuff to? And work out, work backwards to so figure out how many briefs they can take on and go backwards to then work out like how many should you do in the next week or two weeks. Um, and then incrementally, so once, you, once you've once you got that in your head, try to build efficiencies into the process. So try to get more out of each person. Um, and then once you've got that, then you can start to add additional people on top. Um, I made the mistake actually of adding lots of people on top, being super inefficient, um, and then realizing, damn, this is, this is terrible. This is giving me a super big headache and all the partners of the business had to just jump in and do everything for a few years to the point where we realized, okay, we just got to keep leveling up on efficiency. So that's what we've been doing since. Uh, and our headcount hasn't massively increased in about a year, year and a half, because we've been improving the quality of the team, improving the efficiency of the team, kind of upskilling everybody. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, and yeah, efficiency is basically broken down into those two original things I was talking about, which is add quality and add, add quantity. Um, I hope everyone's still alive, by the way, because I'm just talking and talking. I'm running out of breath here. So, Jem, is everything okay over there? Everyone all right? 
Cool, cool, cool. All right, sweet. I'll, I'll carry on. I'll have a little uh, sip of tea for a second. Okay, so um, I think I've covered this point already. Cool. So how to increase the yield of a sprint? So this is like thinking, how do you actually reduce the cost or get more volume? Um, I've given a bunch of things here. Um, I will just quickly skip through a few things. Um, utilizing existing assets is definitely a way to keep costs down, uh, which comes down to good asset management. Like we have one person internally who basically looks after the folders, rearranges things, ingests new assets as they come in. Um, you know, really to make sure that like old assets keep getting used because we were running into this habit of like producing, 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 but we weren't using some of the old assets, for, which was still pretty good. Um, having a really good framework for iterations. So, you know, just having uh, the way the way I think about it is like, can I get an existing project and just like quickly iterate on it? So we've started to, sh as part of our process, we can actually force every everyone in the post-production team to upload their project files. So if it then needs to be rebriefed, it's just a single click of, which I'll show you in our system in a bit, single click, rebrief, the project file is there ready to go. Um, keeping costs down, everyone knows this now, but I'll mention it, hire from cheaper countries. Um, we have some lead editors in the UK, just because it's quicker to, for the CSs to communicate directly with them and sit down and talk through the ideas together and things like that. Um, but then the bulk of the um, post-production team is actually remote and they handle the heavy iterative work. Um, the next way is a really simple way is like just an obvious thing, but just reducing downtime um, of the editors um, by just, I think time tracking is number one because um, often people are not working their full hours when they're working remote. So start there is a really easy win. Um, the second thing is like, just giving them ability to do their own open briefs. So allow them the, uh, the ability, like I said, to, to kind of, write their own briefs and I'll, I've got a document which shows like how, how you can actually implement that in it which I'll give away in a second. Um, incentivizing content from customers um, and then the rest is all the AI stuff so this is pretty much our AI stack at the moment. I'm sure a lot of the presentations have talked to death about AI by now I'm pretty sure so I'm not going to go into depth on this one but um, just transforming statics into videos with runway and Photoshop, um, voiceovers in 11 labs, uh, making avatars in arc ads, super cool. Um, translating ads into different languages. We do some stuff in Spanish to kind of widen our reach. We use HeyGen for that. Um, and then just generally image generation, we use MidJourney, create your own server for your company. It's much more efficient. Uh, I actually prefer the, uh, the one in Discord than the one on the browser because you can control Command C, Command V and spam it 10 times and get like 40 results in one go. And it's much quicker than doing it on the browser. Uh, Flux is actually much better at producing realistic faces. So when we're doing faces, we're, we're mainly using Flux now. Uh, and Photoshop generative fill has its place when you're kind of like trying to, you know, generate around a certain part of the image, but not, but not all of it. Um, one pretty cool thing I saw earlier this morning actually was um, they got a, a static of a suitcase in a nice background. Um, they turned it into a video in runway, but then it distorted the suitcase. So what they did is they turned it into a video, um, allowed the distortion to happen, but they got the original static and put it back on top of the video and it looked perfect. The whole, everything around it was animated, but the static in the middle was, uh, um, the suitcase in the middle itself was preserved. So I thought that was just a pretty cool thing I saw this morning. Um, sprint calendar, and um, this is an old version of our sprint calendar. I, I just didn't update it. Um, but in principle, you've got like week one and week two, and it never quite falls exactly like this. But in week one, the principle is they're briefing. And by the Friday of the first week, all briefs should be submitted by creative strategists, by the growth team to the post-production team. Um, and then the second week is more around like research, ideating, um, coming up with a plan for the next sprint. And we call it the ad plan. Um, but that gets set in stone by the final Friday of the sprint in time for the beginning of the next two weeks. Um, and then I'll, I'll cover this with like, the ad plan is basically our planned work. It's like what we plan to do in the sprint. So in sprint 18, we're going to plan to do you know this many ads. Um, the truth is like growth work is kind of unpredictable. <laughs> um, sometimes you'll get stuff that is just winning uh, and there's it makes sense to focus all attention on that as opposed to what the original plan was. You've got to be reactive and adaptive. And that's one thing that's key to success in our industry, right? So I actually got one of the teams to do an analysis on this and every single ad that was briefed uh, for a period of two months. And I think it worked out it was about 1800 ads uh, for this one particular team. I got them just to keep a note in a sheet of whether it was planned or unplanned. And I actually uh, planned being the ones that were planned during the ad plan in this kind of sprint, official sprint planning process for the next two weeks. Um, and actually it turned out that like, you can see here, like roughly, I don't know what the math is there, but roughly 60% of stuff was planned, but then a good 30, 40% was actually unplanned, is more reactive. 
and initially I thought I was concerned because I was thinking, hang on, you know, the plan. I was concerned overall before I started this exercise because I thought, okay, the planned work is not getting executed, and I was a bit overall worried, especially when we make commitments to clients and things like that. That you know we're going to do things by a certain time. Jumping into it, I realised some of the unplanned work is actually performing really well, uh, and it's just because we're being reactive to what's performing in the account. We're checking motion, plug. Um, we're checking motion, and we're just seeing something is popping off. So we're kind of removing things from the plan and pushing it forwards. Um, so sometimes, like I put here, you've got to break the plan in exchange for like what the data is telling you. Um, it's it's really like an 80, 80, 20, 80 per 20 rule here. Um, and yeah, I think like a, a good point overall is um, like, and this is analysis we've been doing the last few days. So I thought I'd just chuck it in as it's happening. Um, the impact of our work is actually deferred. So when you see something is basically what what's happening here is like when we launch ads in January, we're noticing the impact is not happening necessarily in January. A lot of the spend is going into February, March, April, and onwards. So if you want to keep continuous performance, it might, it's not just about making ads for the next two weeks in that sprint or making unplanned ads for now. You've got to think about what impact that has downstream. Um, so in this example here in January 2024, um, we basically launched a bunch of ads. And you'll see that basically they contribute towards 29% of the total spend for that month. But then those same ads that were launched in January, so this launch date, when we looked in February, they contribute to 38% of all the ads launched in February, and again 22% of all the ads um, of all the ad spend, sorry, in March. So you can see basically the stuff we're doing in January has this huge impact in February, March, April, May onwards. So there's like this kind of compounding effect that happens. So you really want to be thinking ahead of like, okay, my work that happens now is like going to impact everything a few steps ahead. And this is just a cool chart that I saw that kind of like basically puts this data into a chart and shows you there's that kind of like decay effect over time. But the volume under the chart, the volume under the line is the most important thing. It's not about the peak. Um, yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of my what I'm thinking about planning a work. The next thing is like, how does the work actually get executed? Um, like, I, I'm sorry if I'm rushing this. But like this is like this is like obviously me trying to go through as many things as I can to pack in as much value. But um, at, at life cycle, um, I'll start by saying like this is my problem statement. Like a lot of people start thinking this, and this is where I was like four years ago, five years ago when I started to do the creative stuff. Like in my head, I'm thinking, oh, I'm a genius. I'll just come up with stuff and wait for something amazing to happen. Um, it doesn't it doesn't work like this. You've got to be like much more systematic about this. And so I actually ended up breaking it down into like a step-by-step -step stages. Like what do you actually need to do to make ads perform, uh, to produce ads at scale? Like what do you consistently need to do day in, day out? I ended up breaking it down into these multiple different stages. Um, so I capture the ideas, present them to your team, figure out what the priority is, put it in a plan, right? Next step is brief them, right? Build a storyboard, do some layouts, um, make sure things are compliant. Um, and then name your ads correctly. We actually have an auto naming uh, functionality that we've built into our uh, own work OS that we built. Um, we, we've got a basic software that we built that runs this process now. I started in monday.com, realized that we reached a limitation of what was possible with it, and we ended up building something internally called Ad Sprint, uh, which at the moment we just use internally for, for ourselves. Um, we have thought about actually you know, seeing if other people want to test it out for us and give us some feedback, but um, it's a tool that we use internally, which I'll show you in a second because it's going to be easier for me to demonstrate it than for me to talk about all these things. Um, editing is like work gets allocated to a member of the post-production team based on their availability, based on their skill, based on not giving them too much fatigue on working on one client all the time. Um, they see the brief, they edit it, design it. Um, there's then approvals. It goes through internal approval, compliance approval, external approval if we have a client. Um, and then th things get launched. We haven't yet built the auto launching out of our software, but that'll be the next step. For now, it's auto named and we download the asset, put it into our ads manager directly. Um, and then the con conclusion. So for now, we're using motion for that. Get the metrics, conclude it, document the learnings, share the wins, and more importantly, share the losses. That's something I'm trying to push at the moment because people are not doing that internally enough. They're just launching an ad and if it spends nothing, they're like, okay, spent nothing. Um, they need to really unpack like, why did these ones spend nothing and why did these ones spend? So that kind of like breaks down an overview of like how our st uh, stages of our process work. Uh, and I think it's better now if I just actually show you the system, like what it looks like. Um, and I hope you all can see my screen. I think I'm sharing everything. <clears throat> so if we just start with like an overview. So this is our software ad sprint. Um, you can see we manage everything in here, like ad creative production, landing page production, content request, production request. But I'm just going to show you the creative stuff for now. Um, 
we've got an overview of everything here. So I've just filtered it by one of our clients. You can see everything that we're doing for that client. We've got it in like um, a table view, which is nice because you can see everything or you can see the stage that everything is up to. Um, and by the way, you guys can build this into monday.com or Asana or ClickUp or whatever. <clears throat> That's where I originally started. Um, we moved here because there was limitations on what you can do in the software, like the UI is fixed. Um, it, it's just like very limited in terms of, we we maxed out on all the automations that you could use. We used make.com, we built a bunch of scripts. Like in the end, it got so confusing to use that we ended up having to, having to build this thing. Um, so things start in the backlog. So this is like where the ideas get captured. Um, and effectively, like I'll bring up one of the ideas. You've got the name of the idea. You've got, is it an image or a video? What sprint you want to launch it into? So like which sequence, uh, sprint 18 is like the 18th sprint in the year. There's 26 sprints in the year. Um, is it an existing concept that you want to link it into or is it just a new concept? Uh, you know, what is the landing page that you want to run it to? Who should work on it if you know who you want to work on it? Uh, an inspiration of what the ad should look like. Um, and then, yeah, that's basically just how you capture an idea. Pretty simple. Um, and then from from there, you can basically submit it to briefing if you want to submit it into the plan. Um, from there, we then brief things. I've just filtered this by like one of the briefs. So just to show you guys to make it simple for you to see. We then, and again, you can copy this into your system, put it in a doc, put it in monday.com, put it in whatever you like. Um, but effectively, this is the information that we um, that we basically document for, for a brief. We have some instructions for an editor, the aspect ratios that we want it, want it in, target duration, what platforms we're launching to. Is there a specific offer we want to push in this? Is there a content creator we want to actually use um, in particular? Um, and then we have like all the variants. So you'll notice here we've got like four variants. Um, and I can add addi additional variants. <clears throat> what I mean by variants is like in an ad set, we'd launch three to six variants, right? So in this uh, this particular item here is like one ad set. Um, and in this ad set, there's going to be four ads uh, where there's four, you know, four variants. Um, and this one particular variant, we've broken it down into like three scenes and we've got the copy for the scene and what action you want to see on the screen. Um, so this is like a storyboard where, you know, we're demonstrating to the post-production team, like, you know, how should it look? And we can move these around if we want to, swap around with the order. Some of the iterative work we do is actually changing the hook. Some of it is change the order of stuff. Um, some of it is change the copy. Some of it is change the action. Some of it is change the asset. So this allows us to kind of swap those things around when we're doing iterations as well. Um, and we tried to break things down into like marketing terms because we realized people weren't thinking in like marketing frameworks. So literally within our storyboard, we like force people to use these things, you know, like are you introducing the product? Are you giving social proof? Are you making an offer? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And you know you can add scenes here. Uh, this is a live brief, so I better actually delete this. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of like in this stage here, right? Um, and where am I up to? Yeah, someone's plugging my charger in because my battery is dying. Give me a second. Cool. So once it's been briefed, it goes to edit, and I will give you an example of one that is in edit, just so you can see. 4512, that'll be a nice one to look at. 4512, uh, maybe it's in brief. Ah, we already looked at that one, approvals. Yeah, so once it's gone through edit, you've got to get it approved. So effectively, this is the brief. This is all the information you've previously seen. And then this is an ad that's been rejected. You some comments around like why it was rejected. Um, and then basically like the things that have been approved. So like you, you've got to build like a good approval system into whatever you're using. We used to use monday.com with page proof, which is pretty cool. Um, like if you were still on like Monday, you can you can use that. You don't need to use, you don't need to code something from scratch. Um, but that, that was the previous solution that we used that we kind of moved away from about. We actually did a hard reboot in, in January. Um, and then, yeah, you can see kind of all the actual ads that, you know, will be launched, the aspect ratios, uh, any comments and who's approved and, and who hasn't approved. Um, and then finally, just like launch. We haven't automated the ad launching yet. Uh, we've got a, a person launching ads, but um, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, we have this naming convention, uh, which I've got a slide on where you can you can steal our naming convention. Um, this is actually super important for motion because um, these underscores basically, um, so between each of the, this is like a delimiter between all the different columns, right? Um, and we use these um, basically points here to actually create filters on motion to create custom reports. So everything that's put into the brief generates this ad name automatically. So you see here, there's a, I mean, this one hasn't been given a concept name, um, but you'll see that like, I don't know, this one is about this product here, right? 
uh, hyperpigmentation. Um, it's a prospecting ad. There's no content creator. You can see the name of the creative strategist. Uh, now that I've got that in there, it'll go into the ad account uh, when we upload it and we go into motion. I can now filter by this person's name so they can physically see the ads that they produced uh, and they know how their ads are performing, uh, which is really good because like, Overall, like our team is incentivized and individuals are incentivized to actually um, perform. So this actually really helps with with that. Uh, and then finally, conclusion, we've not fully built this one out. We do use a sheet for this, which I'll, I'll show you as well. Um, so oh yeah, that's like our ad naming. You can steal this, screenshot this, steal it, do what you like with it. Um, where's it gone? Yeah, we, ha we have a sheet for uh, document our conclusions, which I think is in, an, in one of the slides. But if not, I can send it to you guys. Um, but as an example, like you basically just want to document what did you learn from this and what are the next steps? So that that's kind of like what we're doing there. For now, we're actually doing it inside a sheet. Um, and then like overall, like one of, the, one of the issues is like, how do you stop? I mean, I'll, this is a principle from like, um, I think it's a Japanese principle about Muri, Mura, Muda. Um, initially, like when one person is making everything, so when they're strategizing, making everything, there's a limit to what they can do. Um, eventually you need two people. So I think about this as like a creative strategist and an editor perhaps. Um, but then at some points there's not enough briefs going in and at some points there's not, some points there's not enough edits happening. There's just like an imbalance in resource. Um, and then other times it's like, you don't want to be in this situation where like nobody's doing enough. And the most ideal situation is where everyone is doing just enough. Um, so the way that kind of like we're currently solving this problem is actually um, enabling our kind of sub teams, our content creator team, post-production team, and CRO team to originate their own work. So I mentioned about open briefs and post-production team actually making their own briefs from scratch rather than waiting for a creative strategist. Um, we made a tier system. Um, I've actually given a link to this doc here so you can take it, but these are the screenshots of the doc itself. Um, in essence, like tier one brief is like completely open. So we give an angle, a rough direction um, for what the editors should actually, actually kind of work on. And they come up with everything else themselves pretty much. Um, it's good for like lead editors, people who are a bit more experienced. Um, so they they can actually change a copy if they want to. Um, sometimes the CSs do provide copy. Um, and then all the way through to a closed brief where basically it's done like shot by shot. Everything is like laid out. Um, I see if I can see an example of a closed brief in here actually. It'd be good to show you one. Um, if I go back to 4512, I can show you that. Brief 4512, no, not that one. Give me a second. Four, six, sixteen. Mm. No, I'm not going to be able to find one immediately, but a closed brief is like every scene is completely laid out. You've got the copy, you've got the action, you've got the assets, and you're almost kind of doing the, the storyboard for, for people, like, like um, step by step. So it's pretty prescriptive for editors. It tends to be our junior editors take this on board. Um, and it tends to be like, um, where is it gone? So more junior ed junior editors take this on board, and more of the senior editors take take these ones on board and, and do those. And then, yeah, oh yeah, there's a screenshot of our conclusions uh, spreadsheet. Um, so we've currently got a, a status thing here, which kind of allows us to tag winner, loser, and conclusive. I think we can do this in motion as well. So I think that the um, I'm not sure why we're still doing it in a sheet and not doing it in motion, but um, for now we're running it in this way um, with the documented learnings as to like why it worked, what, uh, what we're thinking, what, what should we do next with this? Um, so that's kind of like the team itself, how we plan the work, how we do the work. The next thing is like, how do we actually make it go faster? Um, I realize I'm at 45 minutes already, so I'm gonna try and go as quick as I can. So how do you spin this wheel faster, right? Um, the first thing is like daily data visibility. So this is our office, there's our head of growth, Lucas, and one of our growth strategists. Um, there's literally TVs in the office right next to where people sit and work. Um, with this dashboard on there, um, which basically breaks down like the key key things that they should be looking at every single day. Um, and they have targets. The red line is basically like tier one target, then it's tier two, then it's tier three, then it's tier four. This particular pod has got to hit, you know, a million in spend. Um, and this is this projection is based on the run rates, so like how much have we spent month to date and how many more days are left left in the month. So what do we think we're going to spend by the end of the month? And then here's the actual spend. Um, and then you've got the kind of main KPIs that we look at. So number of briefs launched yesterday, last seven days, um, month to date. Brief is also equal to ad sets. You can think about this as like each ad set is three to six ads. Uh, so times this by three to six to get the number of ads that we're, we're making. 
um, the amount that was spent in the same time um, zones, uh, uh, time periods, uh, and the ROAS. So these are the kind of key metrics that we want everyone to look at every single day. Um, if you want help on like how to build this, just just shoot me afterwards, and I can I can tell you that the top three here were generated by our software Ad Sprint. Um, these ones have come directly through Supermetrics um, into a sheet, and then uh, you know d directly into this dashboard that's built in Looker Studio. Um, you need Raspberry Pis to power the TVs if you if you need if you're thinking about how to actually get it onto a TV. Um, and yeah, here's a summary again of like uh, what those KPIs are. So I think about these as like mainly output KPIs. So the spend, the ROAS, the revenue. Uh, we then have like input KPIs, like how much are you producing? So we're always tracking like per day, how many creatives are being produced. And you'll see here, this is by week over the over a longer period of time in 2024, like how many creatives are we producing? So I think this is really important to see like an overall kind of cadence of like, are we delivering enough, vol enough volume? Um, and like the second thing we look at is like speed. It's so you've got volume and speed. So like, how do you actually make things go faster? First of all, we set an SLA internally for our creative production team of seven days. So that's seven days from the point that the ad was briefed through to the point that the ad was ready to be launched. Um, so like, what actually impacts that? Usually revisions. So the less revisions, uh, the more likely you are to actually hit that seven days in total. Um, so that's kind of like the key thing to think about. Um, and then we actually have then a breakdown inside inside ad sprint that actually shows you um, like all the different stages it's gone up to and at what timestamps it went in and out of that stage. Um, so if something's gone over that seven days, we try to unpick, and you can do this in monday.com as well, by the way, by having counter columns. Um, you can have start date and end date columns that show when it went into that start and end date, and then you can subtract those and come up with a number of hours um, that it was in those stages. And that's how we used to do it before. It's just that creating dashboards around, that was pretty tricky. Uh, but you can actually achieve this in, in monday.com or I'm sure you can also do it in, in other similar softwares that you guys are using as well. Um, but typical reasons for breaches or why things are going over, briefs being not clear, um, the visuals not matching the messaging, and then CS's creative strategies are getting them back from, the edit back from an editor and wondering like, what, what does this even mean? It's not working. Uh, language barriers, because a lot of our post-production team are from uh, Latin America and the Philippines. Um, and then, <laughs> excuse me, uh, just general quality control issues, you know, think subtitles being wrong or something's in the wrong place, misspellings. Um, wording compliance can be an issue because a lot, a lot of the time the editors don't understand uh, exactly what the wording compliance is and what they can and can't say, so that can cause problems. And then branding as well. Some brands are more particular about how they want things to look, so that can cause issues here. So we try to minimize the number of times we hit these things happening and to actually hit that seven days overall from edit being initiated to it being completely approved by everybody. Um, the other thing that majorly slows it down is actually approvals by people uh, internally and externally, but mainly externally. Um, we have some clients who say to us like, oh, can we approve twice a week? I'm like, nah, if you want performance, you've got to approve like every day, every other day. You know, it's it's too long to wait uh, once a week. It's not it's not going to get you what you need. Um, so that's like an overview of our uh, like main kind of KPIs and SLAs we have internally. Um, and then finally, I think this is useful because I always like want to know what other people's tech stacks are. Um, I made a sheet covering like everything <laughs> that we use. Uh, I think in the end, I don't know how many rows are on here, but there's like 50 or 60 different softwares that we use in total. Um, I've given like what team uses it, how much it costs, what the, you can literally just see everything. Um, use whatever software that you want from here. If you're not sure like how we're using this software, just ping me. Some of them have been canceled as a marked as um, card frozen, the rest are active. Um, and then, yeah, just mentioning about like, I think ad sprint is something that we're keen to get feedback on to see if it's something that we want to push forward with as a project uh, to move externally. And I'm keen to like speak to people who are like having pain points around their work, own work OS, building things in monday.com specifically, because I have a lot of experience with that one in particular, um, just to understand like, what did they, how did they kind of overcome these work OS issues? So I want to, I want to talk to as many people as possible about what they're doing on that, on that front. And if somebody is producing thousands of credits per month, you know, I want to talk to you because I want to just collab and, figure out what's going on there. Um, I have given our entire flow chart of like how all this process is set up that you can copy and paste into Monday if, if you want. Um, I keep saying Monday, but you can use ClickUp, Asana, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's actually a few flow charts, which I've put in the docs that you can just still use. It's basically like a yes, no type thing. Um, and then, yeah, like I've also given a link to people who want to have access to this and, and just test it. Uh, we're not charging for it right now. We're selectively going to choose some people to test it out. Um, just to kind of see like what the feedback is like. Um, but this is basically what's enabled us to produce like thousands of creatives per month. Um, so I think like, I'm keen to just put it out there for the first time and see like, you know, 
what do people think of it? Um, and I want to know how other people are producing, you know, creative at scale um, outside of kind of AI. And the last thing, just plug working with us. Like if you want to work with us, we do work on a paper sale basis as an affiliate. So if you've already got an ad account running and you want us to run in tandem to you, you want us to do some additional work and you're already spending like at least 100K a month uh, at bare minimum, um, you know, we're looking, we, we're looking to take on more affiliate deals and we can work as a full service agency if you're spending at least 100K a month. Um, and we've also got agency ad accounts where we give cash back. So that's my little plug. Um, so if you want 5% cash back on agency ad accounts, you know, you basically get for every million you spend, you get 50K back, um, which is always going to help. And you can, you know, bump up your uh, your targets if, if you're getting that as well. Um, and that's pretty much me. That's it. So that, I know that was, I blast, blasted through as much stuff as I could as fast as possible. You can find me on X. You can find me on LinkedIn. If you really want to contact me urgently, there's my WhatsApp. I'm a bit nervous about putting my WhatsApp out there, but I do have a business one, so I switch it off after hours. Um, you can hit me up on there. Um, don't send me long messages. Don't send me long voice notes. Don't send me dodgy pictures. Just like only hit me up if you want to talk about creative at scale or if you're doing something cool or you want to talk about ad sprint or whatever. Um, I'm keen to have conversations, so I'm open to that. And that's pretty much me done. I, I think I blasted through that. I don't know if I, it's been like how many minutes? 52 minutes. Oh my God. I love taking Q and A as well, by the way. So I've only got eight minutes for Q and A, which is a shame, but uh, let's what see. What we, we're we're going to have to jump to the next one, but Shabazz, you talk about this stuff so casually and it's just gems on gems on gems. You want to stop sharing your screen real quick? <laughs> oh, sorry, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you're good. You're good. You're good, man. Oh my gosh. Everyone in the chat is like, I could take a full day of this. Essentially, you crushed it, man. You crushed it. Amazing. Thank you. I just I always want to just like contribute to the world, man, of e-commerce and see what other people are up to. So like I'm I'm always game. If anyone wants to talk afterwards about this stuff, just hit me on WhatsApp or or wherever. I'm I'm always game for a chat. And then everyone else, like I said, check out the docs tab. Everything that Shabazz had mentioned is all there. Okay, so you want early access, you want all the docs. It's literally all there. So go check that out, please, please, please. So Shabazz, you want to do some rapid fire? Try to get some some stuff. Go through, man. Go through some stuff. Okay, you've done a really good job of answering a lot of questions as you proceeded through your presentation. So I think I'm just okay. going to stick to the ones where it's just a little bit different. And the first one is a recruiting question from Alex. Okay. So would love some tips on recruiting folks for the data team. It's the question oh that God. Alex has. Oh, I, I can't say I specifically have an answer for this because I'm not a wizard at recruiting data people. It's just we so happen to upskill one guy who is still in the office. Like if we managed to upskill... <laughs> upskill a grad by just keep giving him spreadsheets and we keep giving him uh, challenges in Looker Studio and he just learned SQL off his own back and he's just been amazing. He's been with us for like two, three years now. And like, so he kind of built himself up and then we had somebody else who's based in Pakistan who um, basically just like has experience doing SQL, building databases, he's a developer. Um, I, I can't say like I had a strategic way of like finding them. I just got introduced by an existing staff member to that person. So I don't have a really amazing answer for that one. Um, but other recruitment in other areas, I can probably help message me afterwards about that one. But yeah, hit me with the next question. Perfect. Systems combined with amazing people always seems to work well, I feel like as a common theme. Okay, Dima has a Dima has a question. Shout out Dima here. So this is going back to the triangle you had of low cost, uh, high production, and then just like high volume. So you were yeah. talking about picking two. If you have a big enough team, could you do all three? Yeah. It's a very theoretical question. I'd probably just say no, <laughs> because like you always have to compromise, right? It's just there's always some element of compromise in every industry. This triangle exists, so like I'm gonna I'm gonna go with no. Dima also has another question here, talking about like the creators that you start to leverage. So is it better to build your own roster of creators or use a pre-built service like a Billio or whatever it might be? So we use Incense a lot to actually recruit our content creators. I think that's a really cool platform. Um, we do some recruitment directly through through Instagram as well. Um, the question was, should we go, what was the question? Should we use agencies or should we find our own? It's like, should we, like, do you have your own roster of people that you've oh. built up through like recruiting on Instagram oh, yeah, yeah. or do you Sorry. lean heavier into like the other services like an yeah. incense? I got it. Uh, it depends on the client, depends on the project. So like if it's something new that we need. So for example, like we had like, um, we we're working with Jeep and they needed like a specific type of travel content creator that we didn't have on our books. Um, so we had to go on incense and put a new uh, thing out there. Right. Um, but then we do have like a roster of people who work with on a regular basis. And honestly, the best thing I recommend is like have them in a WhatsApp group. It's super annoying to have a zillion notifications, but that's why I have two WhatsApps. I have one with like all my zillions of like groups with people and one for just my like personal peace of mind where my mom messages me about like, have I eaten today? <laughs> that kind of stuff. 
So like the, the one the one with business is basically has all the groups of the content. We're probably jam I don't know, we're in like maybe 30, 40 groups of the content creators easily. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Nuts, nuts. Last one here, and then we'll then we'll wrap it up. So it's just dealing. JL asks, how do you deal with unreliable creators holding up production, late work, poor work, not following instructions? You have your KPIs, but what do you do when yeah. things don't happen the way you want? Uh, I'm not going to swear, but don't work with them again. <laughs> <laughs> I had that answer in my head, but it didn't, it didn't come out because I'm like, I'm, there's too many people listening here. My mom's going to watch after. So I've got to like, uh, sorry, mom. Yeah, just don't work with them again. <laughs> uh, honestly, it's just, it's just about like, uh, when you start working with people on a regular basis, you get to know who are the good ones and who are the slow ones. We don't have a bulletproof way of like holding them to account in the way, in the same way we have with our internal team. Because with our internal team, I'd be like, yo, why haven't you done the work? Okay, I'm doing it. Content creator, oh, haven't you done the work yet? Oh, sorry, I haven't done it. Oh, you know, I'm busy doing blah, blah, blah. You can't hold them to account in the same way. Um, I think eventually we will probably give people specific SLAs and say, okay, you got it. We do say to people, hey, give us the content within two days normally. Um, they don't always hit it. The ones who are good do consistently hit it. And the thing that speeds it up is the WhatsApp groups. I can't say this mm -hmm. enough, but like just pinging them the brief in WhatsApp. And what I have is I have my content career uh, team assistant in the WhatsApp group. So she can put the brief that's gone in by the creative strategist into our uh, system. So, like I'm kind of using WhatsApp as like a unsystematic way of doing things to communicate fast with the content creators. But I've got an assistant in every single group that extracts the brief, puts it into ad Fire. It gets done and it makes sure it gets paid, puts the budget in there and all that kind of stuff. I love it. Oh my gosh. Shabazz, I think it's so cool because like I think I, we've known each other for what, like three years now, maybe surprisingly over time. Pretty and much. just everyone, everyone in the chat, just know like watching this, I, I know where this started. You know what I mean? And like the systems are yeah. so much more impressive today. So you see like the the skill evolve over time. So man, shout out to you. Thank you for sharing so much with the community today, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. I've been working on this every single day of my life for the last three, four years since we first met. So like, I'm hoping it's improving. It's time to ship more winning creative with Motion's creative analytics platform that helps you scale winners into unicorns and helps you figure out where your ads might need just a little more help. Join over 2,100 teams shipping winning ads with Motion like Viore, True Classic, Hexclad, and more. Get a free VIP tour today and you can see how Motion can help your creative strategists and your media buyers speak the same language.